I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by John Michael Greer, an author who writes on ecology, politics, appropriate technology, oil depletion, and the occult. John has published dozens of both books and articles, many of them on peak oil, economics, history, philosophy, and related topics. In a 2005 abstract called How Civilizations Fall, A Theory of Catabolic Collapse, he described an ecological model of collapse in which production fails to meet maintenance requirements for existing capital, which we'll be discussing today. So John, welcome back, sir. Thank you so much for joining me again. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on again. So Today, we're continuing our discussion from last time. Again, I had a ton of feedback about our first interview, mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to kind of drill back down on some of that. I also had like questions from the audience, so I thought mm -hmm. I, I'd put a few of those in. Um, we're, we're discussing your theory of social decline called catabolic collapse. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if we could start by asking you just to basically briefly restate the core idea for anybody who might have missed our first interview. Okay, the, the, elevator, the elevator pitch version is that every society uses its available resources to generate capital of, of all kinds, everything from buildings, technologies, knowledge, trained personnel, the whole nine yards, all of these things cost further resources to maintain. What typically happens to every society is that the amount of capital it builds up exceeds what it has to, to maintain that capital. And so sooner or later, you end up with a catabolic crisis. Um, the, a lot of the capital has to be abandoned. It's just converted to waste. And depending on, the, there are other factors we can get into, but if that spins out of control, you have the grand old story of the decline and fall of a civilization. So that's catabolic collapse in a, nut hole. in a nutshell. It's just a matter of too much stuff to maintain, too few resources to do the job. Yeah, yeah. Well, and thank you for running through that again. So you had cited, and again, this was my initial research for the interview, you've cited peak oil as a causal factor driving catabolic collapse in our society. Mm -hmm. And that was something, again, we had a lot of audience feedback, and some folks had just said, you know what, I'm over peak oil, producing more than ever. And, and others had <laughs> said, well, you know, maybe there are some other factors at work, and, and you know, I'll mm -hmm. come into this later. Even others had said, no, it's not peak oil, it's the environment. So w w one thing I wanted to point out, I think this is important to point out, is that catabolic collapse, the model works even without peak oil, right? Okay. Yeah. The thing is, um, the, the issue of energy supply, which is, of which peak oil is a subset, is only one of many factors. Catabolic collapse is not a, one of these. Everyone, has, everyone likes to have, there are so many people like to have these one factor theories. This is the thing. It's the environment. No, it's energy. No, it's, no, it's everything. Everything that is a resource, everything that has to go into the works to keep things running is a resource potentially subject to catabolic collapse. Anything we produce with that is capital that has to be maintained. So it doesn't matter if, in fact, if we come up with some hot new energy source that allows us to kick the can down the road decades or even a century or more. That's not the end of the story because there are so many other factors. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, in terms of examples of this, and I did a little research for this interview on it, there are roughly 3,800 ghost towns, dozens of abandoned highways, and the United States Census estimates that there were, this was back in 2010, about mm -hmm. 19 million abandoned homes in the United States. Mm -hmm. So maintenance costs money, so does removal. And when financial situations change, both for people as well as communities, nations, the, the world itself, people abandon these things and they, they get stripped later for parts. I mean, does that sound like catabolic collapse in action? It might, but you need to know more than that. Um, basically, if, if there are 19 million abandoned properties and there are 20, more, 20 million more being built, you've still got a growth situation. If there are 3,800 ghost towns, okay, how many new towns are being built? If you start having the ghost towns and the abandoned properties and the abandoned highways piling up, that's another thing. But the thing that I would have people look at is simply look at the quality of your built environment. Look at the quality of buildings, of streets and sidewalks, the bridges that are falling apart. That's where you want to look to see catabolic collapse in action. Can we maintain the resources that we're using right now and if we can't, you know that there's something going very wrong. Go on. Yeah. 
Well, you know, it is interesting. This wasn't on my question list, but one of the things, again, some of the online feedback was someone wanted to ask about privatization of public resources mm -hmm. so that maintenance mm -hmm. could be avoided. And I thought that was very interesting. Well, except it's not avoided at all. Somebody still has to maintain that stuff. Somebody, you know, if you privatize a highway, somebody's still got to keep maintaining that highway. And the mere fact that you've reorganized who's doing it doesn't mean that the resources are going to magically appear like fairy dust to enable you to do that. Now, in fact, I think most of us have seen that things have been privatized and then very badly maintained or even left unmaintained so that the new owners can strip it of value and then abandon it. That happens quite often. So don't get caught up in the, you know, in, in, the, in the questions of detail about who exactly is paying these costs. Okay, society as a whole is paying for it one way or the other, whether it's doing it by way of a government or by way of a corporation. It's, do we have the resources to maintain it? Is it being maintained? That's what matters. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I wanted to get, and this is a little bit more complicated. This was kind of a brain teaser for me to try and come up with these. And so hopefully I won't lose folks. But, you know, the, the examples that we've all discussed so far are pretty simple, concrete, physical objects, right? And in mm -hmm. simple agrarian societies, past examples like the Roman Empire and things like that, that abandoned infrastructure is physical. So it's roads, bridges, mm -hmm. buildings, things like that. In our society, could abandonment be masked or complicated by the fact that we're abandoning legal, corporate, and other non-physical infrastructure and assets? Well, the thing is, that was true in the Roman time, in Roman days also. They had a huge amount of legal, um, uh, they didn't have corporations as we know them, but legal and organizational infrastructure and assets. They had military infrastructure that was organizational, the traditions of the legions and so on. They had an immensely complex legal system with lots of lawyers. Um, that was among what went down. But a society ultimately does have to rely on those basic physical things. If you don't have roads and bridges, how are you going to get products to market? If you don't have buildings, where are people going to live? Where are things going to get done? And so you need to watch the physical, um, the physical plant as much as anything, even in our supposedly, you know, vaporous, abstract, non-physical society. I mean, there's all this yammer about the internet, but what the internet comes down to is a vast network of huge server farms, all of which have to be maintained. I, I know people who, who work managing these things, and they talk about the, the, tra the, the, the you know, sem semi-trucks full of new hard drives and other components that have to pull up every single day to replace the ones that burn out that day. Yeah. So there's a lot of physical infrastructure involved, even in our supposedly less physical society. And that's less easy to fake. You know, you can talk about, well, no, no, we still have this, wo this wonderful corporate structure, even if it's largely fictitious. But if the bridge falls into the river, you notice. Well, that's an excellent, that's an excellent point. And it, the reason that I mentioned this, and I, I actually, I'll get to this in just a second, was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. last time we talked, you know, one of the things that we talked about was this stair step of crisis events, followed by mm -hmm. metabolism, right, where we cannibalize things. And mm -hmm. then that's used to keep things going until it reaches another crisis. Yeah, exactly. Crunch followed stabilization, followed by a new decline, followed stabilization. This is what you see in the decline and fall of every civilization. Yeah. Well, so again, uh, like on Black Monday in 1987, mm -hmm. stock values mm -hmm. were lost. Now, in the dot-com crash, entire companies were abandoned. And mm -hmm. then in 2008, it was loans, houses, companies. I, I mean, there, there was a lot that mm -hmm. we lost there. So it and, seems... And the, and, the one that's, and the one that's coming up is likely to be larger still. Yes, it does seem to be getting bigger, doesn't it? It, it does. It does. It seems like this catabolic process is hard at work. And mm -hmm. as you've said, progressively worse in each case. Now, mm -hmm. the largest effects, though, it seems like were financial and invisible to most people. And then there mm -hmm. was a trickle down of the physical effects, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the, the stock value is lost, the company mm -hmm. goes under, there's a massive loss there, but that impact is spread out. And by the time the company mm -hmm. doors actually shut, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's later and it's, again, it's been obscured or masked, right? Well, it, again, it depends on where you were. Um, in, in, actually, uh, in the, in the dot-com crash, of course, I was in Seattle at the time. And which was one of the absolute 
epicenters of dot com mania. I knew people who were floating bogus. Well, effectively, they thought they thought it wasn't bogus, but effectively bogus dot com stocks. I knew people who were involved in that. They lost their shirts. For them, it was not an abstract thing. They were out of a job. They were out of their house. They, you know, they, they had to default on their mortgages. They, their, their lifestyles crashed and burned. In the 2008 crash, I knew a bunch of people who'd gotten into housing speculation who were trying to flip and this kind of stuff. And again, for them, it was not an abstract thing at all. They were there in the bankruptcy courts. Yeah, and yeah. so the one of the things that was that's going on here is that these the, these these financial crises, which are of course you know that that's kind of that's kind of the froth on top of the economy, but each time it's involving more people. There were more people, I think, directly hurt by the dot com crash than were hurt in, on Black Monday. In two thousand eight, the the two thousand eight two thousand nine housing panic, um, it clobbered a lot of people. And as we're moving in now into, we're seeing stagflation, we're seeing actually a, 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 st a fine stagflationary recession building around us, and a lot of people are hurting. Yeah. So I think, I think a lot of what's going on is simply the number of people who are being directly impacted is increasing with each, with each cycle. Well, it, and it's interesting that you mentioned what's going on right now. So in terms of our current financial situation, and again, this came out of my research, right now mm -hmm. the buzzword is side gig. Everybody mm -hmm. has a side gig, right? Now, driving an Uber after work is, is a popular example. Mm -hmm. In our grandparents' generation, a single man could support a family. Now, in mm -hmm. our parents' generation, it took two working adults. Right now, everybody's scrambling for what's basically a second job. So it, it doesn't seem like folks are getting rich with these side gigs. So is no. this kind of a harbinger of yeah. downward financial no, spiral? It, it's not merely a harbinger, it's part of the process. We are much poorer now than our grandparents were. Sure, we have lots of technological trinkets that they didn't have, but try finding a car that actually runs well. Yeah. Um, try, you know, look at look at the look at the shrinkflation of projects, the crapification of project of goods and services. Um, we we are we are here in here in the United States in particular, but in the industrial world generally, we are much poorer. Which is why everyone is desperately scrambling to find some way to make money um, in order to try to prop up lifestyles that we really can no longer afford. Of course, nobody wants to think about downward mobility, but that's actually what's going on. We are yeah. we are in a pro we are in the process of downward mobility, um, the the grand old upward mobility march to the stars progress all this crap gone end over. Yes, some new some new technological trinkets are going to be coming out. You will probably not be able to afford them. Get used to living on less. That's the shape of the future. Yeah. Now, is inflation a mask on rising costs and decreased standards of living? And what I mean there is that wages keep increasing, right? And people can afford more expensive luxuries, as you've mentioned, these technological trinkets. But when you look at actual inflation adjusted wages, they've remained mm -hmm. stagnant and in many oh, yeah. cases decreased. So and if we, you, yeah, and if you factor in the various kludges that they've used to try to make inflation adjusted wages um, drop less quickly than they have, the, the range of gimmickry used by the feds these days to try to claim increased value is just absurdly. So you're asking, are we deluding ourselves? Are we tricking ourselves with this whole inflation? Yes. One of the major things that's going on here is that all of the major industrial powers are trying to pay their bills by printing money. I mean, the, the U.S. government is borrowing from thin air at this point. We don't. We, we just the, the you know the Treasury prints money. The the Fed takes it in and loans it out, and we have all this the, this generation of unpayable IOUs. Everybody in Europe's doing the same thing. Japan's been doing the same thing at, at a terrifying rate. Um, all of that is inflationary. All of that is debasing the the value of money. Simply because, I mean, what is inflation? Inflation is too many dollar bills chasing too few products. And so the numbers rack up, but, you know, in Germany in the 1920s, when a million pounds might get you a loaf of bread, a million, uh, what, Deutschmarks, excuse me, when a million Deutschmarks would get you a loaf of bread, wow, you make two million Deutschmarks, that's a lot of them. No, it's not. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, another thing that I wanted to touch on, and you mentioned the server farms in the internet. And this is again, this is kind of something I'd noticed because Mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the things that you're talking about are things that I've experienced, and I'm sure all of us have experienced, right, which is the whole point. But um, I'm wondering if the computer and internet revolutions are a form of self delusion as well and and what i mean by that i noticed this in the 90s is that computers are used in business to improve efficiency and reduce cost which creates the illusion of growth by reducing waste but it, it's usually not increasing overall capacity so I, i'm wondering you know has part of this increasing role of computing in modern society been basically another mask on a failing system that we're just trying to squeeze more out of. Mm-hmm. It's that, but it's all, there's also another factor. It's part of the deliberate sacrifice of the working class. Um, one of the ways that our system is trying to deal with its catabolic collapse is we're, we're catabolizing our own workforce. Back before computers came in, back when you could call a phone number and actually talk to somebody, There were a lot of people employed as file clerks, as secretaries, as people answering phones, and so on. All of those people have been shoved out of the workforce and left to scrapple for an increasingly shrinking pool of entry-level and working-class jobs. And where we just um, put in a computer, which in theory does kind of the same thing, sort of. Anybody who's dealt with a phone tree knows perfectly well that it's not a very good imitation. But that's in, so, so yes, it's, an, it, it's partly a mask on a failing system. It's partly part of the process of catabolism where um, millions of people have been basically surplus from the workforce and told, hey, find, you know, go out and find a new job. Well, the new jobs are, are decreasing steadily. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that makes perfect sense. And again, the, the whole idea is this stair step of basically catabolism or cannibalizing pieces to keep the mm-hmm, remainder mm-hmm. going, right? And exactly. so the exactly. workforce would be part of that. You get rid of the parts exactly. that are expensive and you try and you, you try and substitute exactly. something cheap. A yeah. Trained personnel are capital. Okay, in the in the catabolic class model, they're the trained trained people are part of your society's capital. And if you dispense with them, you see, hand them out pink slips and say go away, you just catabol you just catabolize a chunk of your capital. So that's one of the things that's been going. That's one of the ways in which we are well into the catabolic process. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, this, so this was during the dot com crash. It's just kind of a personal <laughs> anecdote. But um, mm-hmm. one, so this is something that I went through personally. I worked at AT&T Wireless at the time it was part of AT&T Global, right? $100 billion mm-hmm. a year company. And mm-hmm. they had made the decision that they were going to invest a billion dollars a year in building fixed wireless technology, right? Which is basically like a cell phone and a house for high speed internet. Mm-hmm. So the, mm-hmm. the, the long and the short of it was after five years at a billion dollars a year, they put $5 billion into this project. When the dot-com economy collapsed, their stock price took such a hit that they ended up selling off. They closed down that division. They, mm-hmm. they, let, they gave 800 people pink slips, and mm-hmm. they ended up selling the remainder of their intellectual property for a mere $10 million to a startup. Wow. So, wow. you know, that that was an example of tremendous losses, right? As you mentioned, yeah. the human capital, 800 people. Now, mm-hmm. at that at that time, believe it or not, 800 people was just a drop in the bucket compared to mm-hmm. the layoffs that were happening in the Seattle area. Oh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I know. But but still, that's an example as part of the broader process by which a lot of capital was converted into waste. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and and it's reused where it can be, and again, it's just mm-hmm. pennies on the dollar. So exactly, it's salvaged to be precise. Yeah, it's treated, it becomes a resource. Yeah, well, so in terms of efficiency, there's a lot of built-in friction in modern supply chains. Products that we buy, you can go out and buy a product at the store. Pretty much anything that you buy is composed of dozens, sometimes hundreds of components. And each time one of those components is manufactured, transported, or processed, there's an energy cost and there's friction, right? There's paperwork, Mm -hmm. there's transportation, Mm -hmm. there's all of these things that go into compounding the final price of the product. So Mm -hmm. do you think that this friction contributes to inflation, erodes buying power, and might be pushing our society's complexity too far? 
I'm not sure to what extent it contributes to inflation as such. Again, inflation is a function, it needs to be understood as a financial phenomenon. It's a function of too many dollars chasing too many products. But it certainly increases complexity to an unsustainable degree, as we saw during some of the recent supply chain problems, as we're still seeing in many industries. You can get too fancy. You can get too complex. Uh, Joseph Tainter wrote a fascinating book a while ago called The Collapse of Complex Societies, where he argued that um, one of the major factors in why civilizations collapse is they get so complex that complexity stops becoming a benefit and becomes an actual cost. It's the, it's the classic logic of um, going beyond the point of diminishing returns. And yet a society in that position usually thinks, oh, we have to add more complexity because that's what's worked in the past. So they'll literally run themselves right into the ground, piling up additional levels of complexity. If you want a classic example of that, watch the federal government try to do anything. You know, uh, hey, we need a new bureaucracy to solve the problems being caused by all the existing bureaucracies. <clears throat> I'm not sure it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I want to touch on anthropogenic mm -hmm. climate change. I pronounced that right. I was kind of worried about that one. Um, <laughs> So anthropogenic climate change, this was one of the mm -hmm. questions online. People had mm -hmm. asked, how does that fit into this? This is, I think part of it is because it gets so much media attention. And mm -hmm. so after our first interview, it kept coming up again and again and again. Oh, yeah. Is it yeah. causal or symptomatic? Should we view it as an accelerant to an existing decline? It's another expression of the same phenomenon. Um, a stable climate is a resource. Okay? And we've been, in effect, we've been dra drawing down climate stability by treating the atmosphere as a gigantic waste can in which to jump, dump greenhouse gases. Now, there are other ways you can, you, can, you can understand the whole process, but generally speaking, our industrial society functions by taking resources, turning them into waste, and dumping the waste someplace where nobody has to pay for it in the short term. That's not a viable approach in the long term. Because if you're converting all your resources to waste, you're going to run out of resources. If you dump waste into existing systems, those systems may stop working. So all of a sudden, California is not getting any rain. All of a sudden, you know, Lake Mead is turning into the Mead Desert. And um, meanwhile, other parts of the world are getting deluged by gargantuan floods. When you, when you dump waste in a stupid way, instead of treating, instead of like, like moderating, figuring out how to control waste production, how, how to do something with it. Um, if you just dump it, it's going to come around and bite you in the butt. So um, anthropogenic climate change is specific, is mostly specific to our society. We don't know of another civilization that managed to wreck the global climate. So it's more of a specific issue where catabolic collapse was, is a general theory. It's a theory of why civilizations fall overall. Ours is adding to the fun and games by being stupid about pollution and by dumping waste into the atmosphere where it's, again, coming around to bite us in the butt. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, and in past civilizations, I understand that also happened. Um, mm -hmm. if, if I remember right, there have been civilizations that have basically taken so much groundwater out that they brought salt from the yeah. ocean into their mm -hmm. groundwater. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, the Romans also harvested so much wood that they basically made the mountains around Rome completely barren, which they remain to this day. So... Mm -hmm. And in the, in the same way, you have situations where soil, I mean, soil fertility is one of the things that gets treated this way. You have many, many civilizations that have expanded and expanded their agriculture and not done it in a sustainable fashion. So all of a sudden, they have catastrophic crop failures year after year after year, and you end up with a real mess. People, you know, people um, reduce to starvation or cannibalism or all kinds of fun things like that. So it's not perfect. You know, there have been ecologically, serious ecological disruptions in past civilizations. And when I get around to, re to revising and expanding this catabolic collapse theory, I'm going to include much more about the sort of environmental process, what's happening in terms of wastes, what's happening in terms of resources. And, and you know, it's, it's, a theory, it's still a theory in process, and it needs further expansion.
Yeah. Well, you know, I would, I would absolutely love to see a revision of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's uh, one of the things, and again, this is just from doing research on it. One of the things that our society is also very good at is relabeling, right? So again, a second <laughs> yeah. job becomes a side gig, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the other thing that I wanted to ask about was if catabolic collapse explains the growing wealth gap in today's world. Now, after the fall of Rome, that wealth and power, what was left, aggregated in the hands of landowners who eventually became the European nobility. Are we seeing the beginning of something similar, maybe even a new feudal system with wealth aggregation in what we call the 1% today? Again, that relabeling of, you know. It's, it's okay, there's, there are some, there's some very different things going on here. First of all, the late Roman empires had fantastic wealth gaps. You had the senatorial class who were insanely wealthy, and you had most other people who were dirt poor. It was an extreme situation. I mean, half the population were slaves and owned nothing, not even themselves. And so you had extreme wealth gaps, and that was one of the reasons that the empire fell, because nobody cared. If people don't have an investment, have any reason to invest in the existing order, they have no wealth, they have nothing to gain by its continuing, they're going to sit back and go, you know, who cares if it falls? And that's a lot of what happens. And, you know, when, when the senatorial class is saying, we all must sacrifice everything we have to keep the Visigoths at bay, and the other 95% are going, why? <laughs> and in fact, one of the things that happens in a collapse situation, um, you get local warlords who, who move into an area and say, okay, I'm now, I'm, I'm now the local warlord. I own this, you know, this valley or what have you. And local warlords cost less than vast bureaucratic systems with a huge wealth gap. It's actually a major advantage to, to the, the poor and working class people. In, in Roman times, when Rome fell, life got a lot easier for most people you know, down there at the bottom, down there in, you know, um, in the working classes. Because oh, instead of having to support an emperor and the imperial bureaucracies and the money lending institutions, we've heard this story before, and all the rest of it, you just have to keep, you know, to keep a local warlord and his warriors happy. Not, you know, not that big of a deal. And yeah, so it's after that, after that collapse, yes, you started to have um, those local warlords becoming landowners, gradually picking up more and more wealth, the wealth gap gradually expanding again, becoming the nobility, um, their wealth eventually being taken to the cap by the capitalist class, the capitalist class becoming the 1% we have today. So we're near the end of one of those cycles. And one thing to keep in mind, the senatorial class in Roman times did not become the feudal nobility. Most of them became crow food. Um, they did not survive well in that process. Equally, the 1% that we have now, the people who are scrambling around trying to find you know, bomb shelters in New Zealand or what have you, they're toast. They have no way to survive and prosper without a huge bureaucratic system propping them up. Um, they're not the people who will be the local warlords because the local warlords will know how to handle people, how to deal with people, and they'll be personally brave and capable of handling, having personal fighting, as in, you know, actually grabbing a weapon and going at somebody. Those it, are the warlords of the future. It is, it is interesting, you know, it, and, and again, I, I'm, just about out of questions, but um, yeah, the, the Roman history, one of the things that I've noticed is we tend to mm -hmm. condense, again, this catabolic period of collapse, yeah. which took hundreds of years, we tend to condense hundreds of years down into, okay, it just fell apart, you know, uh, Rome got sacked, it's all over, but the, the, yeah, there was we're, a, we're in fact, yeah, it took centuries for this process to bottom out, and yeah, and now we're already in, in, the, in decline. We're already well into the decline process, whether you're talking about Western civilization as a whole or whether you're talking American civilization, you know, we're, we're heading down the slope. But that doesn't mean we're going to be in the Dark Ages next Thursday. It means we're, part, we're in a process that's going to unfold over centuries. Yeah, yeah. Well, John, thank you again for your time so much today. So let me close with this. The Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates to counter inflation, which has been up 9.1% this year alone. So mm -hmm. to me, this seems like a harbinger of a major upcoming event. If you were gonna guess, when do you see the next crisis event happening? Well, it depends on how you define crisis event. Um, for a lot of people, we're already in crisis. 
um, if you look at the rate to which, well, for one, one stat that I was reading just yesterday, um, imports across the Pacific, by ship across the Pacific Ocean to the United States have dropped by 75% over the last year. People are not buying stuff. Inflation is cutting in. We have, as I mentioned, a stagflationary recession building. So um, we're in the in the in the early stages of a fairly serious economic crisis. Are we going to have like a major stock market crash? I and mean, we've already have the Dow down what twenty some percent, and it will probably go down a good deal further. Will it crash in some kind of apocalyptic fashion? I have no idea. As for timing the market, as for saying, you know, when is X going to happen? Do not go there. Isaac Newton, we've all heard of Isaac Newton, right? Isaac Newton tried to time the South Sea bubble and he lost everything he'd invested. Okay. I am not as smart as Isaac Newton. Neither are you. Neither is any, any of the people listening to this in all probability. If he can't time the market, don't try. So I have no idea when. I do expect to see a lot of economic unraveling. Um, the United States has backed itself into a serious corner, um, running up totally unpayable debts as though they don't matter at a time when more and more of the world is abandoning the dollar as a, as a reserve currency. And more and more of the world is rather irritated at the very high handed way that we tend to swagger around the planet, insisting that everyone has to do what we want. Um, that's not a recipe for a good situation. That's not a recipe for a national peace and prosperity, not by a long shot. So I expect to see over the next decade a process of brutal economic unraveling and, and reorientation. It is quite probable that the U.S. will have to default on its, on its national debt. It is quite possible that a lot of other debts are going to have to be cleared by bankruptcy. We're talking major corporations going out of existence here. And having to pick up again from from scrap and you know take the wreckage left over by a very serious round of catabolic collapse and see what we can put together out of it. On that note, let me thank you again for your time, sir. Thank you for having me on.